Good morning, uh, everybody. Thanks for coming, uh, dear professors and classmates and the uh, audience. Um, my name is Aaron Sedilis. I'm from Colombia. I'm a geologist. And as part of my presentation for the uh, Chain Arctic course, uh, I recently decided to work in the topic of geology. Uh, I decided to call my presentation Treasures Beneath the Ice. So, um, it is uh, normally well known that the Earth itself is a living thing that is always under processes and is always changing, right? If we look up on the north, in the North Pole, uh, with, with, in this animation, we can see how the ice has been not only retreating, but also uh, decreasing in, uh, in thickness and, more important, in age. Uh, if you see uh, the, here, the wider the color, the older the ice. It is, this is so important because in order to recover the ice from the winter to the, to the, to the summer, this white old ice is so necessary. So if we lose uh, too much of this ice, it is really difficult to recover this, uh, uh, this ice uh, coverage. So um, there is, this gives us, give us uh, evidence that in a near future, actually in our current lives, in, uh, we can see a nice free Arctic. That is what they call a blue future. I would like to address this issue from a different angle not talking about the environment, not talking about politics or the natural resources, just looking at, it as, uh, looking at the Arctic as a treasure chest. So what is beneath that ice? What happens if we have access to all of this? So I will just show three examples of three geological uh, treasures or wonders that have, that have been found there. Um, just to uh, know where we will be going, this is the Alpha Ridge, this is the Lomonosov Ridge, and over here in, in the, the Gekko Ridge. Ridge. So, so the, the first, first example comes from, from the Fram, Fram expedition made by, by a professor from, from the University of Bergen, of Bergen. Uh, inspired by the, by the, by the works, works of John Ho. Uh, he decided to, to go in, in two expeditions, expeditions, one in 2011 and the other one in 2014 from 2015, to, uh, to try to investigate the possibility of, a, of an impact of an asteroid that is beneath the Arctic. Um, he didn't manage to go to the, to the place he wanted to go. That the, credit, the impact is thought to be here, but he, the ice conditions were so hard that he couldn't go there. But he managed to make great discoveries. First, as you see, this white line represents uh, the coverage that cannot be done by, by icebreakers. Oh, I forgot to tell. This is a hovercraft. It, it is uh, like a vessel that can somehow float in, in a cushion of air, so it can move in the ice and also in the water. So that's why he managed to go where the icebreakers couldn't go. So he, by the first time, uh, was able to map all, the, all these parts of the Lomonosov Ridge. These yellow uh, sections here is the things that Previously, were done with icebreakers. So, he first discovered one of the first things he discovered is the actual life that is beneath the ice. They put some cameras and they found there were fishes. Yeah, and this is the locations where they found the different species of fish beneath the ice. Also, he managed to discover that this ridge, okay, has not always been uh, under the level of the sea. There, it once wa was over the, over the sea level. How, he can you, uh, how can you know this? Because with the seismic, seismic profile, th that is like a radio, radiograph from, from the bottom of the sea, you can see that here we have uh, the structures are cut. So it means that there was some kind of erosion. And it only can happen if, it, if the, this fissure is uh, uh, above the sea level. He also managed to discover new channels. This is a canal uh, that is like the, field, like the Oslo Fjord. And it also shows that the changing Arctic concept is not only that the Arctic is changing itself, 
but that our perception about it is changing too. So how we get to know it, how do we understand it, is also changing with the advancement of science. So moving further down to the south, the second place I, I'd like to, to talk about is the uh, existence of a volcanic caldera. Yeah, I put this Arctic on fire because normally when you think about the Arctic, you, you just think about ice and cold things, not uh, the possibility of huge uh, volcanic eruptions. Well, a team from a Russian university, they managed to go there and make some uh, six seismic profiles and echo soundings, and it the, the discovered and confirmed the existence of a volcanic caldera that is 40 kilometers uh, for 80 kilometers wide. And this is a huge, this is a monster volcano. It is, uh, all, they compare it to the, uh, uh, the power that, uh, that an explosion that happens in Yellowstone could have. So this is really un uncommon because in the environment of the ocean, these things were thought to n not happen. So this is a really uh, interesting breakthrough in science. It was published in the last year. Uh, okay, I've been talking about uh, ocean ridges, but I have not explained what ocean ridges are. Yep, uh, the Earth is composed by layers, the tectonic plates. Yeah, they're moving against each other, breaking apart. So in the mid the oceanic ridge, it's where the new, new crust is being formed. And as uh, it happens, the water that is uh, the water that is down there gets heated up, and hydrothermal vents like this can happen. And in, in the Gekel Ridge, a team from the University of Bergen managed to discover the existence of these uh, uh, hydrothermal vents. And why is this so important? Because uh, in these vents, actually life uh, managed to evolve and exist, and there are living things that can support uh, conditions of temperature higher than 300 uh, degrees Celsius. Yeah, and um, okay, uh, why is important here in the Arctic, and why is mo uh, what is better to find it in the Arctic? Okay, the thing is that the Gekkel Ridge is a special ridge because it is uh, spreading slower than the other ridges in the planet. So the composition of the uh, the 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 inner parts of the Earth that gets exposed there, it's thought, it's thought to be similar to the composition that the Earth had in its beginnings when it forms. So, being able to study how the, the life gets to evolve there can give us an insight how the life evolved in the early Earth. And furthermore, having access to these uh, places can serve an, as an analogo, analogous to exploring uh, the possibilities of life outside the Earth. This is the specific case of the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter. This is Enceladus, uh, an icy moon of Jupiter, where you have a situation pretty much like the thing we have here in the Arctic. You have an ice shell, and an, an ocean, an icy, and a rocky core. It is theorized that uh, these vents can happen. So if we can have access to these bands, uh, we can somehow study how is the possibility of life uh, outside the Earth. Okay, and now that we are looking by the realms of the planet Saturn, I would like to take back a look to the Earth just to finish the, with the presentation. And I'd like to finish saying, as Carl Sagan would say, looking at the Earth with, from that distance with only a pale blue dot, and I would like to take the message home, is the takeaway message is that this is the only pale blue dot that we have. So, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I found the other papers about uh, uh, explosive uh, uh, pyroclastics, 
but I didn't put them because I thought it was too much. But I, I don't remember exactly the location, but yeah, there are some proof of some acid. Uh, and also, I saw some uh, pill lavas, and I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, they, they are there. Yeah, exactly. That, that caldera. Ah, by the way, uh, the, they say the calculated age for, for the eruption is 1.1 million, million years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, can you guys? Yeah, that works. <laughs> um, dear teachers, students, and guests, welcome to my presentation. I'm Liesen Haug, I'm from Germany, and I specialize in coastal protection. And this is what we are talking about. Human activities have changed the face of the Earth for a long time, and also including the Arctic, of course. All over the globe, coastal hazards um, are increasing in frequency and intensity. Therefore, we have to do something to mitigate the impacts, spe especially for the um, most vulnerable countries. There are different scenarios about how the climate has changed and will change in the future. Guess why? The climate is very complex and it's hard to understand. But let's focus on what we are certain about. The Arctic reacts very sensitive to temperature change. And we know that the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the world, as you can see on the map. Yeah. Or um, expressing us with the words of uh, Morten skovgaard Olsen, the coordinator of the Arctic program of the Danish Energy Agency, the Arctic we will have in the mid-century will be very different from the Arctic we see today. Consequently, global impacts will occur earlier than we have expected. The degradation of permafrost, the destabilization and melting of Arctic ice, and the changes in the carbon cycle, and of course, many other issues in the Arctic, um, will lead to a change in weather patterns all over the world resulting in very severe consequences for many countries. So, this, uh, this already leads me to my red flags. Nowadays, it is clear that the current changes in the Arctic will make changes in the global climate change more severe than indicated by the majority of the recent, of recent climate projections. The release of methane and carbon into the atmosphere will increase, and since there exists no fully isolated ecosystem in the world, of course, they will spread. Another consequence will be the change in the ocean circulation system, resulting in severe changes even in regional climate patterns. The changes in the weather pattern will be especially severe in the northern hemisphere, as we highly rely on the Arctic as our, as our refrigerator, so to say. In general, we can expect more severe uh, weather extremes. A warming of the oceans will also lead to changes in the marine environment that can result in serious consequences for the livelihood of many people. Just to name one example, there will be um, more frequently occurring harmful algae blooms. This is um, a phenomenon when certain circumstances come together, like temperature and nutrition, there will be a, a suddenly occurring algae bloom, and this can be very toxic. And for example, when fishers are catching fish in the region, this can come in our food, uh, food chain, 
and can be very severe. And also by direct contact, that can lead to health issues. But this is just one example. But for today, I want to focus on, the, um, on how the accelerated melting of Arctic ice and the warming of water bodies is intensifying the global sea level rise. As you can see on the graph here, this is from 1995 up to 2003, the sea level is never fully stable. Yeah? Even in one year, we have fluctuations. For example, here, always goes up and down a little. But of course, nowadays, we can detect a general trend. And this is approximately 3 millimeters per year. There are, as I already said, there are many different scenarios. But um, most of the scientists, they come up to this number, around 3 millimeters. Glacier melting, ice sheet mass loss, and the thermal extension of existing water bodies have led to sea level rise, and this is an ongoing trend. And there's no end in sight. As, uh, as with this ongoing warming, the changes will be irreversibly concerning to human time scales. So the damage we have already done, we can't, can't barely take it back concerning our lifetime. With the degradation of coastal ecosystems like mangroves or other wetlands, the erosion of shoreline is more intense, resulting in loss of land. When the water is coming more and more into the land side, the degree of salinization will intensify. And of course, this will, um, this will go into the fresh water, it will affect agricultural areas, and and other areas. A, ri a rising sea level will cause more intense coastal hazards that are likely to occur, occur more often, damaging people, property, and the environment, of course. I included the next slide because I think it demonstrates this issue quite good, because maybe it's a little bit complicated to understand why the rising sea level also leads to more coastal hazards. So by um, determine the normal sea level. We take the normal high tide, of course. The, the highest the water comes up normally to the coastline. Yeah? If a coastal hazard occurs, a storm surge, intense flooding, whatever, uh, it can reach a certain amount of land area. Yeah? And when this storm surge, for example, occurs with the same intensity, but with an upward shifted baseline, of course, it can also reach more land area. Yeah? That in comparison. And th these are just different projections. And as I said, there are many, but this is, this is a good basic picture of how this will work. So... This is my vision of the bio future. It will, all be, it will all be about more water. And I used the simple words to describe the fact that um, the water bodies will increase in volume and in mass. Sea level rise and its impacts on human and property and the environment will intensify. And so will the interest in the coastal region, regions because we want to fight this, yeah? especially in the low elevation coastal zone. This is the zone under 10 meters below sea level, above sea level, sorry. So from the sea level and up to 10 meters. Because this is an area where a lot of people settle. Because it's very practical, yeah? People always wanted to live on the coast because you can have easily trade and traffic. This area has always attracted people and it will do so in the future. Even with all these projections we have, people are not scared. They just move there. So nowadays, it already contains 10% of the world's population and 13% of the world's urban population. And this is interesting, because in the cities, they are, they are the assets. Yeah, they are uh, expensive buildings, they are harbors, they are train stations. This is all very expensive, and of course, we want to protect that. So, let's tackle um, possible... Um, solutions and prevention measures. I guess there's no need for me to mention that we have to regulate um, the greenhouse gas emissions as drastically as possible. 
to reduce and to stabilize the concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, so it will be possible for us to make more precise predictions. To do so, we need the cooperation of very smart engineers and well-informed scientists. First, um, here, for example, you can see the Thames barrier. Yeah? This is such a construction against uh, flooding. But there's a trade-off, too. You might guess these constructions, they are not cheap, and they are very hard to maintain. And second, they take up a lot of space. And that can also lead to further ecosystem degradation, worsening of the water quality, and disturbance of, for example, fishery areas. The third way to mitigate impacts of, uh, um, sorry, the impacts of coastal hazards is the conservation and restoration of coastal ecosystems, like, for example, marshes and seagrass beds, mangroves, coral reefs, that can buffer the effect of waves and storms, so the shoreline is more secure. Yep. So, where is the green shift in my context? I think the green shift has to happen within the society. The first step will be to acknowledge that these issues are real and every one of us is responsible. To be able to approach climate change and sea level rise, it is important for us to understand the main contributing, contributing factors as well as the main weather components to be able to make more precise predictions. Furthermore, it is, it is essential to identify the areas with the highest risk, but also to consider the socioeconomic development in this region and the presence of valuable construction work. So, if you are a person now who doesn't believe in the intrinsic value of the environment, maybe think about the consequences for those who have to deal with the global impacts. Some countries are more vulnerable than others. And I, th and I don't mean with that the risk of exposure. Vulnerability addresses the ability of a state to conquer issues that might arise in the future. For example, we all know the Netherlands are very exposed to sea level rise. But in comparison, they are a rich country, and they are able to install expensive protection measures to, to support them, to save them. But other countries are not in the same position, and sea level rise will not be equally distributed. Asia and Africa are the um, continents that will have the highest impacts. And I can just hope that the rest of the world will feel responsible to help them. It is hard for us to change our habits, and if a resource is available, we all want a piece of it, of course. And nobody wants to clean up afterwards. And that is the, a good situation or a typical situation for the tragedy of the commons. But if we want to have a safe future for us and the, the generations to come, we need to be a little bit smarter than that. Maybe we should consider the, our, the consequences of our need for exploitation and consumption before we discuss how we distribute the Arctic resources amongst the nations. And maybe leave this region as untouched as possible. Because the most efficient way to protect people is by protecting the nature. And you might have noticed that I did not talk so much about the Arctic. But I think nowadays it is more important than ever that we finally realize that everything um, we do on this planet will have an effect somewhere else. Thank you very much. So. This was all very sad, so this is my picture for questions. <laughs> so. Yep. Every region that is pretty flat, basically. <laughs> to answer that very simple, every region that is very flat and where there's nothing in between that can block coastal hazards. And also regions where there are additional effects 
coming, like for example, subsidence. This is something we discovered also not um, this long ago, actually, that um, cities are subsiding. So in general, areas are subsiding, downwards movement of the ground, but cities, and especially cities in deltas. This is due to the material they are built on. And of course, they are at the coast. And people calculated the sea level rise, but then they forgot uh, to include the subsidence. So you will have the sea level rise and subsidence on the other side that will somehow intensify the effect. Other questions? That's pretty funny. So, that one. Um, so, you have to imagine the Thames like this, right? And then the Thames barrier is just blocking the way, more or less. We have these gates. They have 10 of them. And in between of the gates, they can lift up um, the barrier in case if there's a flood coming off. There's the, if the Thames is just going up, yeah? It's also, this is not always a catastrophe, that happens normally, yeah? Once in a while, this will go up. And then the people in the, the harbor, they will notify it, and then these um, gates, they will be filled up with the water of the Thames, and then they move this thing upwards. And they can do this in like 90 minutes, or if it has to go very fast, in 15, but yeah. And it costs like, it did cost over 500 million pound, yeah, <laughs> so not cheap. Yeah. There's a, if this is interesting for someone, um, you should definitely check out what they did in Venice, because they, are, they had also a very interesting program where they, you know, like, Venice is basically a little bit formed like a bite, and they try to close up this area, and there's a thing in the ground, like a huge plate, and when they expect a flood, they can lift this thing up. I think it's not even done yet. And <laughs> there were many engineering uh, problems on the way. For example, they did not calculate that when you lift this thing up, it will be full of sand, and then you can't lift it down anymore. So they have to have people to clean it before they want to put it down again. And also, interesting fact, if we have a little bit more time, um, you know, like uh, the... Uh, how do you say it, the, the water from the toilets and the sink and so on, it still just floats out into the water, right? And they kind of forgot to calculate it by constructing this, and now if they pull this up, after a couple of days, it's going to be very uncomfortable there. So, yeah, we need smart engineers in the future. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Raul Silva, and I am from Mexico. And today I'm going to talk about the history of the life of the Arctic. We, know, we all know about the current concerns uh, in, in the current situation of the Arctic, but it is important to know about the past of the Arctic. And uh, the paleo paleoclimatology is the scientific study of the uh, climatic conditions in the in the past, and usually when w we want to read a story, we need a book, and we also need a language. In nature, we have uh, natural records such as uh, sediment rocks, sediments, rocks, ice cores, uh, tree rings, and corals. And if we know the language to read these records, we can uh, start telling stories. The, language, uh, the languages are called proxies, and we have different kinds of, of, of proxies, like such as uh, organisms, isotopes, uh, minerals, geologic features, etc. In the Arctic research, the most uh, common uh, natural records are the sediment cores, 
which can be from, from the oceans or from lakes, and also the ice cores. Uh, one of the most common proxies are the biological proxies, in which uh, if we know the ecological conditions in which this organism live, and then we find them in, in the uh, sediment records, we, ca uh, we can start inferring the, the past uh, environmental conditions. In the case of uh, chemical uh, proxies, the most common are uh, isotopes, in, particul in particular oxygen isotopes. These isotopes can help us to understand the temperatures in the past. If we measure the, the ratio of these isotopes in the skeletons of organisms. Well, I want, I, I'm going to tell you a, a short story about the main uh, points during the life of the Arctic. And uh, in this uh, drama, the main characters are uh, the solar radiation, uh, the change in isolation, and the greenhouse gases. We also have uh, characters that are dependent of, the, of these main uh, characters, which are the ocean and, uh, and atmospheric currents and the, glac the glacial bodies. We also have independent characters, uh, like, such as the plate tectonics, and we also have uh, billions. Uh, one of them are the meteorites and other celestial bodies. The temporal reference of this story will be this uh, international chronostratigraphic chart, which begins uh, 4.5 million years ago. But we will start uh, in this limit between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene. But before we start this story, I'm gonna, uh, I want to talk about uh, a white past. Uh, there was a time where, where the, the, the entire Earth was uh, covered by ice. This is part of the hypothesis of the snowball Earth, which uh, uh, is thought to, to have happened two times during the Earth's history. Uh, the first one, 750 million years ago, and the second one, uh, 635 million years ago. Uh, the, causes, the causes of these uh, global events uh, are the low solar radiation, uh, the fact that the, there was a supercontinent in which more uh, of the areas were in the north part, of, uh, well, in high latitudes, and the occurrence of uh, glaciers' positive, positive feedbacks. Well, now we are, uh, I am going to talk about the chapter, the chapter one. Uh, this is the great impact. Uh, I forgot to tell you that this history has uh, different colors, and the first color is, 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 is red. This event was the 16, 65 million years ago, and it was, uh, well, there was a meteorite which impacted the Mexican territory. And this caused the global climate change and also massive extinctions. And this also started the Paleogene period, which is our second chapter. During this period, we have uh, a big event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, in which, uh, well, this happened 56 million years ago. And we have uh, a big positive anom uh, anom anomaly of temperature. This had global effects, like, uh, such as the sea level rise, acidification of the sea, and massive extinctions. Uh, at this time, there, was not, there were not uh, ice in any place in, in the Earth. And the possible cause causes of these uh, huge events are the release, the release of uh, huge amounts of greenhouse gases. Uh, one of the hypotheses is that these uh, greenhouse gases were uh, released, released by these methane hydrates, which, can, we, which we can find, find in the deep oceans. Well, in order to visualize the magnitude of this uh, event, here we have uh, an image where we can see the sea level uh, in that time. 
Here we have uh, a picture of a uh, Inuit man, Johnny Isaluk, uh, who is holding this picture of a uh, swamp in North Carolina. And this is how this region looked like during the using. Also, uh, the finding of some fossils, uh, both animal and vegetal fossils, uh, help us to uh, understand that this was the, the main landscape in the Arctic regions. Uh, also, there have been found uh, this kind of palms in high latitudes, which indicate us that it was really warm. Here we have a famous oceanographer, uh, James Sackos, uh, who is holding a sediment core. And we can see this transition of colors from uh, light color to red. And this indicates us the acidification of, of the sea in this time. So if you can notice, all these effects are similar to, uh, to, this, to the effects that are happening now with the current climate change. And it happened uh, 56 million years ago. Well. Now we're passing to the uh, final of the Eocene in the transition, transition between the Eocene and Oligocene. And uh, even though I'm not going to talk about the Arctic, uh, I'm going to talk about the Antarctic. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of the current or, or the modern ice ages. And this happened uh, when the Australian continent rift away from the Antarctic. And this enhances that this uh, oceanic current encircled that this, this uh, Antarctic uh, continent. So it enhances the, the, the creation of the Antarctic ice sheet. And this uh, entailed uh, a, a, a global climate change. Well, the chapter three of, of our history is uh, the ne Neogen period. Uh, during this period, uh, it was very warm. Uh, actually, the Arctic, the Arctic Ocean was occupied by forests. And uh, this peak uh, Pliocene warmth uh, was evidenced by fossils in marine, uh, well, by marine fossils. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, well, some estimations indicate that the temperature was uh, 19 grades degrees uh, higher than in the present. This is very important for the Arctic story, uh, the Quaternary, because uh, during, this, during this time we had the development of the large ice sheets in the, in the north uh, region. We also had the development of this uh, oscillation between uh, maximum glacials and minimal glacials. And, uh, well, I'm going to pass this fast. Here we have uh, an illustration of how the, the vegetation is migrating north and south during this uh, oscillation of glacial and minimal, and minimal glacials. Uh, we are now in the Holocene, uh, which, uh, well, I'm going to talk about this penultimate interglaciation in which uh, the solar energy during the summer was greater than any time subsequently. Actually, the Arctic summer were five uh, degrees warmer than at present, uh, and almost all the Arctic glaciers melted completely. Uh, finally, we have the last glacial ma maximum, in which, uh, in contrast, the temperature was uh, 20 degrees lower than uh, in the present. And since this moment, the insulation has been decreasing uh, in response to the precession of equinoxes. Uh, well, uh, because of this, the glaciers became uh, reestablished or, or advanced. Well, the final remarks of this uh, presentation, uh, well, we have not uh, that this story is announced uh, with red flags, green ships, and blue futures. The red flags uh, can be seen as the uh, main forcings causing uh, global changes. The green ships are these changes noticed uh, both in the vegetation and in the fauna. 
And the blue, blue future is definitely the, the future of uh, uh, free ICs. Uh, we have seen, well, the, 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 the history of the Arctic climates are identifi have identified the, that uh, the Arctic is very sensitive to some feedbacks. And, uh, well, uh, the main conclusion of this is that the natural records can help us to understand uh, the natural variability and the variability caused by uh, external, external forces, forcings, like uh, the green, greenhouse released by the, by, by the humans. So, uh, this is all. <laughs> Thank you. Of the, oh, so the, the next geological period defined mm -hmm. by humans. Yes, yes, yes. It is definitely the, the, the forcing that we are uh, creating as humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we know by the paleoclimate uh, evidence that the Holocene is uh, characterized by, by this, uh, by this uh, decreasing in the insulation. But with our activities, we are enhancing the, the global warming. So. Definitely, this uh, the all in uh, in the future studies will be characterized by our appar appearance in the in this uh, movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no? Oh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to play like some kind of a bit, let's say, depressing song to put, uh, to put you in the mood for my presentation. Hopefully, the YouTube will not play any ads. Yeah. It's called, oh, what, sorry? No, it's okay, it's okay. It's called uh, Save the Arctic, and it, uh, it's a campaign by the Greenpeace. So now, first of all, my name is Milica Adamovic, and I come from Serbia, and I study biology at the University of Belgrade. And today, I'll be talking about the responses of Arctic biodiversity to climate change. So first of all, I need to address the point that uh, from the ecological po viewpoint, the, uh, the, the definition of Arctic is a bit different. So uh, the Arctic in ecological sense starts where the existence of trees is not possible due to uh, cold and harsh climates and lack of uh, suitable substrates and nutrients. So that area north of tree line has an average July temperature below 10 degrees Celsius. And it uh, defined as that it covers 4.8% of land surface. So when we say Arctic, we, uh, in ecological sense, we think of something that it's called the tundra. And the tundra is like uh, really a, lo a low land vegetation. It, it, it's, uh, it can be divided in uh, two, uh, two parts, which can be like a bit of a lush vegetation, which is, I don't know, if, yeah, which is like, for, uh, which, is, uh, found, which can be found here in the, in the low Arctic, this dark green area. And in this light, uh, light area, the, there, there are some spaces who can be really a void of vegetation, like for example, polar desert. And this pale green, it represents the, the, something that is called forest tundra. And that is not a part of the Arctic in ecological, in ecological sense, because it represents the boundary between the tundra on the, on the north and the, and the forest on the, on the south. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, in contrast to many opinions, the Arctic doesn't represent an, uh, is an isolated area. It is, uh, uh, it's neither uh, isolated biologically, neither climatically nor socio-economically. And the simplest examples for that are like uh, migratory birds and strong climatic connections which, uh, which exist between the Arctic and the, and the lower altitudes. And also from the social spheres, there are a lot of events and policies that happen outside the Arctic and often have a clear impact impact within the Arctic, even it can be uh, a bit unintended. So the main focus of my topic is biodiversity. So I, I asked a lot of people what do they think that biodiversity is, and nobody no knew like the clear answer for it. So, so I used the simplest um, uh, definition, which was made by Convention on Biological Diversity. So biological diversity means the variability among living organisms from all sources, including terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complexes of which they're part of. This includes diversity within species, between species, species and of ecosystems. So to put it in simple words, it compromises for all the variety and variability of life on Earth, and it includes all physical entities who can perform biological processes such as uh, metabolism or reproduction. Uh, so, regarding the Arctic biodiversity, well, expectively, uh, the species richness is generally lower in the Arctic than at lower altitudes. It also has a tendency to decline when going from low Arctic to high Arctic. And by the uh, working group on conservation of Arctic flora and fauna by Arctic Council, there have been detected over uh, 21,000 species of animal, plant and fungi in the Arctic. And physical characteristics of the Arctic, which co compromise for this, who are uh, important for structuring the Arctic biodiversity, include extreme seasonality with variations in insulation, generally cool summers, presence of permafrost, and annual to multi-year uh, multi, uh, sea ice cover. So this can create like heterogeneous or let's say diverse habitats, which range from, from polar deserts to ice caps, to, from wetlands and to oceans. So now the, uh, the effect that climate change has in the Arctic, as we, could, uh, we heard in the previous, uh, previous presentations, well, um, it, it if, uh, especially affects the, uh, the physical and chemical environment, but also it can change the uh, bio bio uh, bi evolutionary biology and ecology of the species. And the environmental changes that are happening now in the Arctic, they're of different magnitude, uh, geographic scope, and, uh, and extent, so that, and they're all happening simultaneously in the Arctic. So it's really hard to predict how the biodiversity, communities, and ecosystems will respond to this. And uh, one, uh, one effect that is famous for the, for the climate change and global warming that is happening in the Arctic is called the polar amplification. That means that the global warming and the climate effect have a much, much more impact on the Arctic uh, or, or, or on the polar regions than on the rest of the hemisphere or globe in general. So regarding the... Regarding our, let's say, assignment for, for, uh, for today, I've decided that uh, I can't really put all the, the phenomenon that have been detected, I can't really put them just in one sphere. It can never be like a red shift or red flag. For me, being a biologist and an ecologist, everything is a red flag and everything is a sign of danger. Everything is a sign that something is changing and not really for, for good. And those, uh, those changes uh, can be in, like, let's say, plant communities. Those are like increased shrub dominance in tundra, which can affect the albedo of the planet, which means that shrubs can keep more heat, can keep more heat uh, that, uh, that's coming from the sun than, the, than, for example, mosses or lichens. And it has been detected by satellite re uh, remote sensing that 40% that, uh, of the Arctic tundra has green. That means that that have, has been an increase in plant productivity and only 5% uh, uh, of there has been in like decrease in plant productivity, which is also can be connected to the to the global change for, uh, to the cl uh, climate change because there are some maybe parasites and, and uh, insects and some diseases that, that are evolving and killing the tundra. Uh, the next is the next is a bit controversial, like mo moving of the tree line northward, because somewhere they have been detected that the trees are moving, 
not like trees can't move, but their younglings can, can go up slope because the, the environment that is now being in their primary habitat is not suitable for them. And they can go up slope and move north, northward, uh, northward in order to find the suitable climate for them. And this has been attack, uh, detected in uh, Eastern Canada, Russia and Sweden. Uh, and this is th this the shifting ranges. I will go, I'm going to explain it by this a bit uh, <laughs> disturbing picture that represents the the uh, um, the meeting of two species who usually don't meet, who are separated. For example, red fox usually you can connect it like with the forest and and uh, stuff like that. But the Arctic fox it lives in polar regions and it has like this this. A colorization which, which helps her to avoid avoid uh, predators. So, so if they their ranges meet, there is going to be competition for the resources because Arctic our Arctic has not evolved enough to have the enough uh, enough resources for both species. So, so it, it affects the uh, it affects their ranges and they come into into competition. And there are a lot of pictures on the internet where they they really are really fighting over everything. <laughs> Uh, and the, the uh, second is a rapid evolution of species. This is more like a, on, a, on a genetic scale because there are a lot of species who can more quickly react to climate change. So the evolution will choose those species, so species to uh, move for further, while others will die off. So that, that that's a kind of selection can erode the genetic diversity within population and it can reduce their capacity to adopt to additional environmental stress. And uh, this is uh, the end. This is um, uh, which is uh, this is connected to the blue future, and it's research done in Svalbard. So in Svalbard, we have two currents. One is warm, other is cold, and uh, their their interaction can uh, uh, it, the, uh, it decides how much of sea ice there is in Svalbard. So in recent years, there have been uh, seen that, that um, sea ice uh, uh, is uh, there's less sea ice on the Svalbard, and then that's why the warm current is more there's much more water in the Svalbard than earlier, and this affects the breeding and foraging ecology. So some species will be uh, will like that because they they will have uh, there, there are some species who really don't like the ice on the Svalbard, and they will then be uh, evolution that uh, there's the they will oh sorry their distribution range will will be become bigger. But there are also ones that are like ringed seals who need who need the sea ice and who need the the, the snow so they can they can reproduce. And this will also this uh, and um, and this also can affect like polar bears because they can't really find their food because these seals they move further from the continental shelf and further uh, further from the uh, into the ocean to find food. And yeah, that, that, that's it. And I will f finish my presentation with this by the Canadian academic, which says, if we pollute the air, water, and soil that keeps us alive and well, and destroy the biodiversity that allows natural systems to function, no amount of money will save us. And that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, well, well, uh, for me, I think that we, we had uh, like a heated argument <laughs> a bit on the on the lecture because there was a fight around the North Pole, whose who's North Pole should be. And I, 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 my answer was leave it to nature because we don't have to be present in every ecosystem and we don't have to be present in every part of the world. And I think that nature thrived before people were there. 
and now there's people and we should adapt to nature and nature shouldn't adapt to us. So I think that we, we, were, we are supposed to leave something for, for the nature and leave something for those pieces who have been there for, for hundreds and thousands of years. So, but because if you put it like in a little scale, like if you put it on like a timeline, if you put like uh, the, the beginning of the earth and to present time, if you put it like in a calendar, it would mean that, that uh, people, people like human population showed up at, on the 31st of the ch December at 11, uh, 11 59 and some seconds in uh, like uh, before midnight. So that would mean that there was like four, four and a point billion years of, of non-human existence and it thrived. It, uh, nothing happened, everything, everything shifted, everything changed and because it was left alone and everything can function like that. But if you put people everywhere and people usually don't see nature, people see resources and I see nature. And that, that's, my, that's, that's why I, I have that, that uh, attitude that we should leave at least North Pole and South Pole alone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and the global climate is changing very fast. It, it, we can't learn from the past because all the the changes that are happening now are really fast. And nature nature can adapt. Nature we need like a year or two to adapt to warmer summers or something. But nature needs hundreds or thousands of years to adapt to those changes. It worked? Oh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alina. I'm from Ukraine. I have educational background in the international relations, uh, but today I'll be talking about the energy in the Arctic and mostly focusing on the renewable energy sources in the Arctic and whether do we have the prospects of renewables in the Arctic region. Uh, so basically, first of all, I want to start with the short definition what the renewable energy means. And basically, this is the energy from the source that is not depleted when used. So we talk mostly about the solar power, wind power, etc. And talking about the Arctic, in the recent years, the world's attention has turned to the Arctic as the uh, major field for the resources. Millie was talking about the nature, and I'm talking about the resources. So basically, that's the thing uh, that people are usually uh, most concerned in the Arctic because that's the resources and basically up to the fifth of the world's undiscovered petroleum resources uh, are to be found in the Arctic. Uh, while today the Arctic share of the world's known resources is around uh, 12%. And as you can see on the map here, uh, today mostly uh, the resources are concentrated near the Russian part of the Arctic, but also there are like many fields and the countries have very, very big geopolitical interest in it as well. Uh, but what about the renewable energy sources in the Arctic? Because everyone knows that we, have the, we are experiencing the climate change today and uh, many of the 
uh, prospects for the future developments in the Arctic and not only in the Arctic can be found in renewable energy. Today, basically, the biggest part, mostly the Conventional petroleum resources uh, are of the biggest focus in the Arctic. But as you can see here, the green spots show the uh, upcoming projects connected to renewable energy in the Arctic. And so I'll come back to this later. But uh, as you can see, there is still a bit of the interest in the renewable energy. And we believe that in the future, there will be much more. So. Uh, talking about the legal framework of the renewable energy and the energy itself. Uh, basically, that is mostly about the United Nations uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea. And the Article 56 says that uh, the states have their uh, interests and uh, they can uh, use the energy from water, currents and winds within their exclusive economic zones. Also, the convention doesn't mention that much the focus for the renewable energy in the future. We can still see that the uh, states can use renewable energy and so they have this right to do it. Uh, although they don't often choose the renewable energy and still stick to the conventional fossil fuels. And uh, talking about the current challenges for the Arctic energy, uh, it's important to mention that there are high transportation costs for uh, either conventional or renewable energy sources. And also, uh, there, is, there are high environmental and health risks, talking about the uh, petroleum in the Arctic, because uh, for those indigenous people that live there and for the local communities, first of all, that's always very expensive to get the energy from conventional sources, and second of all, that's bad for their health. And that's why this creates some other concepts. Uh, the technical aspects, that mostly the infrastructure, and also the local human capacity, which is still about the human beings and their uh, behavior within the uh, resources and mostly like the petroleum in the Arctic. So what about the green shift for the Arctic energy? As you can see here, uh, basically, uh, I believe that the green shift, that is the shift towards renewables and mostly uh, the humankind will shift from the oil to gas, and then they will choose renewable energy sources. Mostly that these are the solar panels and the wind energy that they are going to use. Uh, this transition also will be quite gradual, and we cannot uh, say that in 10 years we will have only renewable energy in the Arctic because still many of the petroleum resources are to be discovered. But uh, in the political framework, the Arctic Council is quite active in this way because we uh, have two main projects, ARENA and Arctic EIA. Uh, of the Environmental Committee of the Arctic Council, uh, where they focus on the uh, renewable energy exploration in the Arctic and where they uh, try to make this shift uh, faster. Uh, also, the carbon pricing is quite an active way of uh, the shift towards the green energy in the Arctic, and basically it means that uh, the, there are the carbon taxes, as for example in Norway, which work quite effectively, and today the country's 98% of the energy production, these are the renewables. And the energy poverty addresses the uh, lack of the in, the lack of suppliers for the energy. Uh, so it's important to, for the local communities and it's, it's, it's kind of the challenge for uh, the, the green shift because energy poverty needs to be overcome first and only then uh, we will be able to see the full green shift in the Arctic. Uh, what about the blue future for the Arctic energy? Well, um, of course, we all know that the climate change that is quite bad for, for the planet, for, for the Earth itself. Uh, also in the Arctic, talking about the shift towards renewables, uh, it has quite positive impact because uh, when our 
Earth becomes uh, warmer, uh, of course, like it increases the level of water, it increases the level of the other uh, things like the solar power, the winds. Sometimes those effects cannot be estimated in, in the way they are going to be, but still that is quite good for the uh, sources that are upcoming and that the humankind can use for the future energy production and especially for the renewables. And the focus of this is mostly the hydropower production, the wind power, and also the energy supply from the biomass. But still, we do have some red flags. And mainly, uh, this means the uh, concerns and the risks for the renewable energy and for the energy itself in the Arctic. First of all, these are the black carbon emissions that, first of all, are bad for the environment, and second of all, they are bad for the health of the local population. And this also creates the energy migrants, and uh, energy migrants, these are those unlucky people who were forced to leave the, their local uh, communities because of the um, high prices for the energy, first of all, and also f uh, because of the uh, bad health effects from the petroleum sources. So this all leads to the renewable future for the Arctic, uh, but still the biggest challenge for the energy itself in the Arctic, that is the isolation of the region. That is quite difficult to reach the region. And uh, talking about the petroleum and the pipelines, we are not quite sure how it all is going to work in five years, in six years, uh, due to the climate change. Talking about the renewables, they need a lot of investments. Uh, and possibly we will have a lot of energy, a lot of solar power, wind power, but still there, is, there are many things that are to be overcome. And also today we have the oil spills in the Arctic waters, which negatively affects the environment, the flora, the fauna, and also it causes those energy migrants. So that is still uh, quite difficult and uh, maybe the hybrid power production might be the result for this because uh, talking about the renew the shift towards renewables we might first of all use the combination for the uh, of the renewable energy sources together with the fossil fuels and then shift towards the renewables themselves and as a small conclusion, I believe that uh, we need to use the holistic approach talking about the uh, Arctic energy, because that, that is not the thing that can be done only with investments. There should be the cooperation of everyone, and we need to have the transportation, we need to have the good infrastructure together with the political approach and together with the cooperation from the local communities. And basically to avert the massive environmental impacts, we need to speed up our shift towards renewable energy sources, uh, and then uh, we hope that those red flags will be overcome and the green shift of the Arctic energy will be quite possible in the future. Thank you very much, and I'm open for your questions. Oh, okay, good question. Thank you. Uh, basically, right now, there is the uh, one a quite successful project uh, launched in Sweden in 2012. Uh, that is the Pitia station, where they use either the solar energy or the wind energy uh, for the production of the uh, energy for, for the region. And uh, it is quite successful because, uh, as far as I remember, they uh, operate uh, 
20 uh, gigawatt of the solar hour, so solar power per hour, and that is quite good. And uh, many people say that uh, it's it, that's the future, and the other countries should like follow this path. So there was not that many things, uh, not that many investments they had, but they launched, and then like every year their uh, volume of the production is growing, and so that is quite successful, and that is like the example to follow. Uh, the yeah the hybrid energy system that is basically the mixture of the renewable energy for example the solar wind energy together with some uh, fossil fuels or it can also be the energy biomass and that is this uh, you know this step in the middle that is to be done between the shift towards the renewable energy sources in the Arctic and between the um, the, the stopping of the usage of the fossil fuels so that is the kind of compromise that they use right now and I know that these projects uh, exist right now in, uh, in Norway, in Sweden and uh, that is not that much about the future but still that is good, good, good compromise uh, in the middle of, of the shift towards the renewable energy sources. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Ekaterina. Uh, right now I'm doing my master in Arkhangelsk in regional studies, but I also have a background in pedagogy. That is why I'm going to tell you about education in the Arctic, about green shifts, red flags, and blue future of the education. Uh, first of all, I would like you to show my plan, uh, how my presentation will go. So uh, when I will speak about green shifts, I will speak about new opportunities which Arctic region uh, in the education phases right now, and cooperation of universities. When I'm speaking about red flags, it's mostly about warnings, warning sites in education, especially for indigenous communities. And blue future will not be connected to something said. It will be mostly about hope and new methods and new programs which are coming up in order to improve the situation of the Arctic region and education about it. Uh, so, the um, interest to the Arctic region is growing right now, especially due to the resource, resource exploitation and climate change, which you've already heard about today. And that is why there is a need of new human resources, which can be well educated and know a lot about the Arctic region and how to actually improve the situation in the Arctic, to create new technologies and methods of exploration of uh, resources, which will not harm the environment and uh, that is why the education is very important in this sphere. And um, as you may see on the slide, uh, we are going to speak about uh, cooperation in the Arctic, which exists in terms of education. There is a cooperative network of universities, which is called UArctic, and this is organization uh, concerned with education research in and about the Arctic region, actually. So you may see that not only Arctic countries are members of this organization, but also non-Arctic, such as China, Germany, and Japan. That means that the interest towards the Arctic region is growing, and it's not only above the Arctic states, but also other countries are interested, because the impact that Arctic region can have on other regions cannot be underestimated. So, uh, you may see here the list of universities. Of course, it's not all universities, only part of them, which are actually members of this organization. So, you may see here universities from Russia, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Greenland, and all over the world. And this is only the tiny list of them. So, you may see that the cooperation about the education in the Arctic is huge, and exchange programs and mobilities among students and research programs are actually happening, and that is very good. Uh, there are different research topics which are focused now in the Arctic. So you may see that that is, of course, environment, 
because we may not underestimate the biodiversity of the Arctic, the unique species and uh, features of this land. Uh, culture, because this region inhabited by indigenous societies which have unique culture and traditions which are need to be preserved. Uh, different fishery patterns, because lots of Arctic regions are actually based on fishery and that is the main source of, uh, like main resource for them to live and that is why it's important to study fishery patterns and how to fish better. Of course, the Arctic region faces different challenges nowadays, economical, political, climatic challenges, and that is important to study them and to be able to actually prevent a region from, uh, from these problems. Again, society, indigenous culture, of course resources, because that is actually the main interest in the Arctic region, different resources, oil and gas, so uh, there are lots of studies about that as well. And, of course, land itself, because of unique uh, ecosystem, unique territories and uh, unique flora, fauna, and everything like this. Um, there exist different mobility programs. So, for example, you may see a couple on this slide. Um, the first one is North North, and Barents Plus is another one. Your Arctic is actually the provider of uh, North North program. So people from the North have the opportunities to go to different northern countries and actually explore the Arctic, to explore the uh, other northern countries and to raise the awareness about this region, to be able to see how actually this region uh, creates and some universities even have special programs like um, in uh, Northern Arctic University in Arhangelsk, there is a program of floating university where people, students from the different uh, universities go to the Arctic itself, to Svalbard, to uh, New Land and uh, Land of Franz Joseph, and they actually study, doing studies about this land and that raises the awareness and the interest to this region. So. Now we are moving to actually red shifts and red flags, and that will be about the education for indigenous people. So you may see here several points, like, of course, accessibility. Uh, that is a very big issue because um, it, is, it can be really hard to get to the schools for some kids, and uh, that creates inequality in education, and that shouldn't be an issue, actually, because every child should have an equal opportunity to get the education in Arctic, and uh, so this is a real problem. The next one is the fact that um, teachers do not have enough um, maybe knowledge about the cultural peculiarities of indigenous peoples, the traditional, the traditional and unique language, and because of this, um, actually the language and the cultures are going like a dying a little bit. So it is important to raise again the interest towards the culture, and some universities actually provide different programs uh, to study indigenous societies. Uh, another problem is that uh, usually rural schools generally have more limited selection of courses than urban schools, and that is also a problem, uh, which also creates inequality, actually, and um, especially in Alaska, for example. Um, because of lo um, low level of job opportunities, lots of young people from the Arctic region move to another regions, and uh, that migration actually creates the problem of lower percentage of well-educated people in the Arctic region. And uh, also lots of teachers are actually going from, to the Arctic from other regions and they may not be actually familiar to these peculiarities of this uh, region. So the provision of trained teachers is also very important and it's a need to be done. Uh, but uh, now I'm going to speak about um, actually good uh, things uh, in the Arctic region, and these are, you may see here, a couple of programs, of course not all of them, but just some of them, uh, which are actually like a hope uh, that there is, um, there is an interest towards the Arctic region, and the government understand that it is necessary to uh, educate people and to work on the Arctic region. So you may see one of the programs is Children of the Arctic, which was uh, created by Russia in 2017 in Arhangelsk. There was an Arctic uh, International Forum ter Territory of Dialogue. And during this forum, uh, it was said that it is necessary to create modern educational programs and methods for the uh, uh, 
students and children of the Arctic region, but uh, it is necessary to save actually the native language and culture of, indig of indigenous peoples. And this is a program, it is a cooper cooperative program of Russia and Finland, because Finland actually has a great experience of uh, providing educational prog programs in the Arctic region. So Russia and Finland are going to cooperate together in order to create better opportunities for saving uh, the language and traditions of the indigenous people in the Arctic. And uh, this program was uh, programmed by a specialist of Federal Agency on National Affairs in Russia and Association of Indigenous People of the North, Siberia and Far East. Uh, the next program, as you may see, it's Arctic Generation 2030. And that is actually a program of Norway and Finland. So Norway is like the leader in this program and Finland also going to help, like co-leader. And this program, uh, the main idea of this program is to create opportunities for northerners with respect on building northern culture, Arctic. Uh, youth must know how to navigate in their own region, how to actually be able to uh, study and to learn their own uh, region. And uh, in this program, there are several main points, like it is uh, necessary to create a knowledge-based education uh, that is necessary to integrate the Arctic into the global knowledge network, and it is necessary to support, actually, the young generation to be able to be a leaders in their own region, so that there was no... Um, like migration, so that actually young population stayed in their own region and developed it, because who better can know about their own region than people who actually lived there for such many, so many years? Uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that, of course, Arctic region nowadays faces lots of challenges, but at the same time, I would like to say that pay attention to the fact that governments are actually aware of this and they're trying to change, they're trying to create better opportunities for the Arctic young generation to be able to become leaders in their own countries, to be able to develop their region, to create new methods, new technologies, because Arctic is changing, the world is changing, new technologies are appearing, and it is necessary to have well-educated people who can actually promote the better cooperation between the region, inside the region, and with the, uh, like with the rest of the world. So, uh, you can see here a list of sources I used, and thank you for your attention. I am glad to ask your answer your questions. <laughs> Okay, actually that's uh, a good question. Um, I may say about myself that I'm actually the member of, for example, North to North. I, was, I participated in that program. So people who are from Denmark, Greenland, Canada, for Ireland, um, Sweden, Norway, Russia, from on the list of these universities are actually can, are able to participate in this program. So uh, students who have studied at least one year in the university and are interested in the, especially in the circumpolar north or the Arctic region or indigenous societies are very are able to apply for this program and to get uh, scholarship support in order to study uh, in the northern parts of, uh, of uh, like, uh, Arctic regions, for example, in Nur University in Norway, for example, or in uh, University of Arctic in Trumsjö, or in Lapland University in Finland. So they can go in there and actually study different subjects concerning the Arctic region. And it's actually good because it raises the awareness about the region itself and helps to develop and promote the ideas on the international base. Yeah, thank you.
the first one will be Nadine Bandari talking about fisheries in the Arctic. So please. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's me, Navin. Today, I'll here be talking about fisheries in Arctic. So let's move on. OK, we can move to Arctic. So what do you think? Basically, it's white space covered with ice and snows most of the time in the year, basically. And we are talking about changes, what's going on. So let's see what are the changes. And if it's obvious that if ice gets changed, it's basically, it's, we get more water. So it's a blue one for me. More area exposed, open area exposed. And this will give rise to vegetations, more floral and fauna. And this is basically because they get more growing season length. So if area is exposed, it will have more growing season length. So it will give rise to the flora. And we can see open area, it will give opportunities for exploiting or exploring the resources and fauna as well. So we'll have a competition. Everyone will try their best. So it makes money. So and they want to extend their territory, jurisdiction, or something, their control over the Arctic regions, so they will have a competition about it. So it's obvious they will do. So why they compete, we can see it's all for the resources. Booming resources, I can say, oil industry, hydrocarbons, fisheries, and the shipping, new shipping routes. Moving all these sides, today I'll be talking here about fisheries in Arctic, basically. And I'll be talking about three perspectives or three pillars, social, economic, and environment. Talking about social perspective, I'm not sure how fisheries started and how it is related with man, because it's from the millions or billions of years ago. When evolution started, people started fisheries, so it has a long history. We can say, and being particular to Arctic, indigenous peoples in this region, they have a close relationship with fisheries as they depend on them for their food, for their economy or something like that. And they have a tradition of collective fishing, so they have a close bounding, social boundings as they have regular interactions or they meet each other during fishing or something like that. And this is, I think this is one of the good things about them. And we know societies which have strong boundings, they have low crime rates or something like that. So it's one of the good things in the Arctic. And next, moving to economic. Every one of us, we know it's a profit-making industry in the present world. And here we can see it's a backbone of economy, although contributes remarkably less than hydrocarbons. I'm saying this here because if we talk about hydrocarbons or oil industries or something like that, they engage less number of people but make more money. Less participation and more money. But in fisheries, more participation and less money. So fisheries, it's linked more to the local people. So it contributes for the local economy, whereas in the hydrocarbons, oil industries, basically the migrants or the outsiders work more in these industries, so they contribute more to others. And fisheries contributes to every country in its own way. I mean, it contributes every uh, economy of every country, but here I have mentioned about Iceland because it contributes more to Iceland regarding its export income, and we can see Export income of Iceland heavily depends on fisheries. Next comes the environment. And it's the, uh, one of the biggest issue in the present world. And we know ice area, ice covered area is 
decreasing day by day. It's due to global warming or something like that. It's uh, consequences of global warming. And in response to it, Arctic is also responding. So we can see ecological zones are shifting from one geographical location to the next. And we can see the movement of the zooplanktons or phytoplanktons in which fish depend. So fish move for food, and it's also changing uh, food, and it moves for, to adapt to the in suitable environment. So we can see movement of the fish, and its population is changing in every geographical location in Arctic. Now moving on next, about the situations. I can see fish are moving towards pole to get suitable environment as global warming. It's, uh, we can see the rise in temperature of water, so it's moving poleward. And as a consequence of poleward movement, we, will, we can see that in near future, probability, probability of fish catch will increase in the poles, more towards pole, I can say. And indigenous species of fish are being out of stock due to commercial fishing, due to its market value. It's, these are being exploited more and more. So it has the consequences regarding the indigenous species. Then comes about the pollution too. And it's about the plastic pollution. By 2050, we'll have more plastic in oceans by volume than fish we have, we'll fish in the oceans. And we have next problem regarding the lack of the biological data. And this gives rise to the poor management of the ecosystems. Now, we have a situation that the fish will have more negative consequences in near future. So I would like to mention here, so, so, Way forward, to have more scientific knowledge, we, should, we must have more research in these areas. And the research should contribute for the common understanding of problem in this Arctic region. And if we have common understanding, we should have cooperation to cope with them, cope with the consequences. And it's obvious that if nature provides us some resources, we should use them. But the concept should be the sustainable use of the resources. So we. We should enforce the sustainable use of the resources and try our best to think beyond the personal interest and act according to it. So it will give rise to cooperation so that we, so that we can make good results for our bright future. Thank you so much. If you have some suggestions or feedbacks, I would like to help, have them. Yeah. I mean, the fish population is moving towards the pole due to the. It's more by local, it's more dominated by the local fishing than the industrial because hydrocarbons in this area is exploited more than the fish. Okay, so you mean the, the financial output, output is, output yeah, it's relatively so less. Thank you. Hello there. Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone, so my name is Alexandra Kaleova and I come from Macedonia. 
Today, as my colleague, I would like to speak about fisheries in the Arctic in the context of climate change. Well, apparently I have a cold, so there might be a voice fl flictation, so I'm sorry about that, but I hope everything is going to go well. Um, so, as we already might know, the Arctic is a region that extends into the nor northernest part of Europe, and it's an area that covers 15 million square, um, 15 million square kilometers. Uh, in the center, there is the Arctic o Ocean, and it's surrounded by its adjacent seas, and uh, it's also surrounded by the coastal states of America, uh, Canada, um, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. So these countries have, according to the law of the sea, have the right to fish in its exclusive economic zone, which extends to 200 nautical miles, miles from the baseline. Um, co the commercial species of fish that are, that are mostly harvested there are the polar coat, capelin, Greenland halibut, a northern shrimp, and a herring. There are 633 species that are uh, currently living in the Arctic Ocean and, and its adjacent seas, uh, seas, but only 58 are currently exploited. Um, and uh, they're, they're able to survive in this kind of hard conditions because uh, of their, of their uh, antifreeze proteins in their blood. So in this table here, we can see that, uh, that the most uh, exploited, uh, the most harvested fish there is the capelin herring and codfish. And uh, this fish harvesting uh, contributes to the 10% 10 10 of the global catch of fish in the world and 5.3% uh, of the global catch of, our, of uh, crustaceans in the world. Well, what is the future of the Arctic in the context of climate change? So we know that uh, the climate change is um, contributing to rise of temperature in the Arctic. And according to the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change, there is two to three times faster rise in temperature in the last century uh, when compared to the previous centuries. This contributes to borealization of the Arctic fish community, which means that uh, the species that were uh, before needed um, needed lower temperatures to, to survive are, are now adapting to higher temperatures. And also the species that need warmer uh, environment to, to live, like temperature above zero degrees, are now shifting to the, uh, to the Arctic uh, Ocean and the adjacent seas. There, uh, there is a potential uh, rise in the, in, the, uh, the, in the catches in the North Atlantic uh, North Atlantic fishes, roughly to 30% by 2050. So as we can see in this uh, chart here, um, there has been a mean shift of 31 kilometers in the last 25 years in the, in the direction of south-north towards the Arctic. And the, and the most common species that, are going to, uh, that, are, that have done this shift are the ones that are written on the table. So what, is, what, is, what are the risks there with the climate change? First of all, uh, there can be um, extinction of species. So now we also, uh, we, we have already started to notice this with the northern shrimp. Um, there has been a depletion of, sor of sources of the northern shrimp, mainly because of overfishing, but also probably because of, uh, of rise of the temperature in this region. Um, there is gonna be also an evolutionary problem with the physiology of fishes, because the uh, oxygen transport to fishes will be harder uh, as, so as, as the, the, the temperature rises. Uh, and also because the ice is going to melt, this region, these areas will be more um, accessible for oil extraction, which means that there, there's, it's more likely that there will be high rate of oil spills, which can also contribute to the pollution of the environment there. Green economy in a blue world. So according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, 98% of the global fish stocks are fully or overexploited, which contributes to 50 billion of US dollars loss per, an, per year. So there are, there are a couple of organization, organizations that are, that are dealing with this issue. Like for example, the Marine Stewardship Council, 
which implements the maximum sustainable uh, yield of fishing. Their policy is that um, the, uh, the fishing has to, has to stop at a certain point when there is enough population to spawn. When, when the population of fish, there is no population of fish to spawn, there will be no next generations and, there will, and we will come to the point of overfishing. There are also a couple of, pub, uh, of published books and materials on fish oil replacement which claim that 50 to 80% of oil in salmonid and up to 60% of oil in marine fish diets can be replaced with vegetable substitutes. Um, in addition to this, uh, with, with the increase of usage of renewable energy resources, there will be decrease in exploitation of fossil fuels, which means that there will be less oil spills in the future, and it, mean, and it also means that the environment will be less negatively affected there. So what, it, what, it, what will be the results? What are the concluding remarks of, of this? It's very hard to predict what's going to happen. So when we're talking about the, the, the consequences of these changes, we're talking about time limit of 1,000 years. And because of the uh, adaptation is very slow, and the changes of the physiology and physiognomy of, uh, and, uh, and then the anatomy of, of fishes is also going to be slow. It's very hard to predict which kind of species will move there. But mostly, uh, most likely, it's going to be uh, the pelagic, pelagic type of fishes, which are not uh, bounded by the uh, seabed. Um, the northern eastern uh, eastward movement of species will depend on density distribution, temperature, and food conditions. It is also very likely that no fishing activity in the Arctic Ocean will appear in the in the 10 to 15 in the next 20, 10 to 15 years because the coastal state sciences decided that they want to first exp, um, explore the, this region and find out more about the ecosystems there and their vulnerability before they, they start to implement um, plans for fishing so thank you for your attention and I'm ready to to answer some of your questions Yes. Well, this is a very, very complex physiological process. But in in in, in simple terms, uh, I, it it affects the spreading of the ice molecule. So, for example, when the ice molecule is, is formed in the beginning, these proteins tend to bound with the ice molecule. So this prevents the ice molecule for from expanding. Therefore, no. A uh, bigger ice surface in the in the blood of this species can be can be formed. Yes. You blue world uh, for me were well, a couple of interpretations of this, but blue blue world for me means uh, opening of the sea when when the ice melts. So therefore, more a bigger surface of oceans, and therefore more access to, to the, the, the surface of the oceans and uh, potential development of, of uh, economies in, in those countries that are close to the ocean surfaces. Hello. Oh, good. Um, OK. Hello, everybody. My name is Mira Boneva, and I come from Bulgaria, but I just graduated in international security. And every time somebody asks me, what does international security mean? It can mean anything, depending on the day and the situation in the world. But today, it will mean the security of uh, logistical and operational processes in shipping in the Arctic. So. 
my presentation will be on uh, the question of are we Arctic ready? Um, first, I'll tell you what the um, procedure with this pr presentation will be. Um, I will speak about the context a little bit, which is pretty much the basic scenario which ship the shipping industry is using right now, uh, which is that there is a shift from the white ice to a blue ocean in the um, Arctic, and how this actually affects the, fish the shipping industry. Then I will proceed with a SWOT analysis of the strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and the threats to the shipping industry in the Arctic Ocean. And I have connected them to different colors as the blue future, yellow bumps, green shifts, and the red flags. And finally, um, I will give some takeaways um, and a general assessment of where the shipping industry is going and how we can be part of it. So, to build on actually Aaron's introduction, the first presentation, I will speak about how the shift from white to blue or the melting of the ice is contributing or is a major factor for the shipping industry right now. As Aaron mentioned already, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, Arctic um, loss of perennial ice between 1984 and 2016. And from the NASA's uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, they have estimated that back in 1984, there were about 1.86 million square kilometers of perennial ice, and in 2016, there were only 110,000 square kilometers. Now, what does this actually mean for the Arctic shipping? As we can see, there is a trend of um, melting ice from 1975 to 2015, and this is the voyages per year. Um, try using this. Oh, here we go. So here we can see how generally it is increasing, and we're talking about up to 300, 350 vessels per year. Um, generally, people think that shipping depends mostly, uh, mostly on the melting of the ice, which is true, but not only. When we look at different factors, such as the economic crisis of 2008, we have this big dive in the number of ships that actually have passed through the Arctic. And we have another one here. This is the 2014 oil price um, dive. So shipping is not dependent only on the melting of the ice, as you can actually imagine coming from uh, the media, because most of the headlines in the media speak only about the melting of the ice and how this has changed everything. So right now, the most used um, path or the road is the northeastern passage here. This is Russia, this is Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. And these are the roads um, of different ships that have passed between 2006 and 2015. Um, as you can see, it's widely used. And one of the reasons for um, this is also that, um, uh, yes, the ice is melting, and therefore it's becoming more accessible. The, the Nordic um, uh, roads are becoming more accessible. So, for instance, the Northeastern Passage, when we compare it to the Suez Canal Passage, um, it takes only a, it's only a third shorter, and takes eight days um, uh, less, and it's $180,000 cheaper, which means that it's quite profitable to actually, if, if, you, if we manage to put a lot of ships through, through the Northeastern Passage. And in July 2017, only 12 months ago, um, Christophe de Margerie, the a Russian uh, ship tanker of LNG gas, was uh, tr uh, transported gas between Norway and South Korea. Um, Another breakthrough was back in 2013 when another tanker managed to transport um, uh, coal from Vancouver in Canada to uh, Finland in eight days quicker than it would have taken it if it actually had gone through the Panama Channel. And uh, this was the Nordic Orion, which was a Dutch, um, uh, sorry, a Danish, Danish ship. And by the nationalities of these ships, you can realize that there are a lot of interested groups and actors in the uh, shipping industry. Um, so when we put all this in perspective, 
we see that uh, today we're here. This is the, these are the main roads. And it, by 2040, 2059, which is not that far, we may be able to even go through here. And interestingly enough, this passage has already been done by a Chinese ship, um, the uh, Nordic Dragon, back in 2015. And it was an icebreaker, however, which was very interesting. Um, they managed to go um, all this way through the North Pole and through the, um, uh, through the thick ice. Now, the question is, where do we stand with the shipping industry? Um, first, I was thinking about the blue future, the strengths of the shipping industry. Clearly, there is a market demand. Clearly, it would be quicker road, and clearly, there would be less piracy, because if you go through the Suez Canal, you have to go through Somalia, which has, through Somalian waters, which have been infested by um, piracy and crime for quite a long time, even though they're going down now. Um, there is also the possibility for cut on transit fees. Now, if we manage to explore the, the, tra the transpolar road, meaning through the North Pole, then ships don't have to go through uh, territorial waters or the, uh, the economic exclusive zones of different countries. For instance, Russia, which is the biggest uh, um, coastal state there. And uh, this would actually cut on transit fees. But when we go back to cost, this doesn't mean it's going to cut on uh, the damages. So uh, one of the important things is um, that um, shipping is very dependent on weather conditions, oil prices, and insurance. Insurance is a very, very important industry, which um, makes, uh, the, um, makes the, the, the commercial viability of shipping in the Arctic. If you don't have insurance, you can't really do anything there. Um, Roadmaps are also an issue. They have the weakness of being too commercial. So, for instance, um, uh, a lot of roadmaps that we see on um, ships going um, through the passages, they're based on whether the ship can logistically go and operationally go through these places. However, no habitat or indigenous uh, usage maps or information is being put through, um, into these maps. And it means that a lot of the governmental decisions on where ships can go and cannot go are not taking into consideration what fisheries are there, what is the environmental impact on them, and what are the habitats. So this is a big weakness. Um, infrastructure development is, is also an issue that needs to be worked on. Even though Russia, for instance, is, uh, putting, uh, is investing a lot of money in ports and infrastructure and icebreakers. They have 40 icebreakers, which is the most of anybody um, in the area. Um, they're still lacking behind, and there, there is a risk of um, uh, not so quick return. But I'll speak about this in a little bit. Um, and, of course, ongoing governance discussion. Uh, so, where can ships go? Who has jurisdiction over what? Um, what if there is an oil spill? Is, are there enough provisions in the um, global governance to actually take care of, of all of this? Um, then we move to green shifts, meaning the opportunities. Of course, financial and time savings, economic growth. You can imagine that the quicker you get um, uh, commodities and goods from one point to another. This means that more and more will um, start coming through this road. Shipping road diversity. This is very important for the um, sellers and for the market. And finally, the red flags or the threats. Um, clearly, environmental impact. Um, it's, it is, there is still not enough knowledge as to, to know how the increase in shipping and traffic in these areas will impact the uh, environment and the habitats. Uh, navigation uncertainty, once again, we come down to the weather, um, harsh weather conditions, and um, overinvestment. Uh, there is a fear in Russia specifically that the, all this money that has been invested is not going to be returned very quickly, because if indeed the um, uh, the transpolar road becomes reality, then it means that not, not that many ships need to go through uh, Russian waters, and it means that they don't have to pay the tax for passage. Um, and this uh, will also mean that they don't have to use too many of the icebreakers that Russia and Canada are offering uh, for rent. 
And to quickly conclude my takeaways, um, of course, governance and better understanding of the consequences, this is very important to going ahead. Um, we cannot go without interdisciplinary cooperation. So here there is more of a personal message towards the scientists. I think this is spe specifically the moment when scientists need to work um, more with the shipping industry because there will be more ships. There is a lot of money in this industry and a lot of interested um, actors and states, and it will happen. But the question is whether they can, from the very beginning, start making it with a mentality of a green mentality of making it more feasible and um, more ecologically friendly. Wonder how that's going to happen. <laughs> um, and of course, international norms need to be uh, developed further through the uh, Polar Code. And insurance industries need to be, um, instead of going for insurance rates, of providing the best offer to um, aim for more protection. And of course, shipping is ice melting is not enough. There are more um, factors. And I'll leave you with this: Are we Arctic ready? Not yet, but getting there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, these. Yes, thank you for your question. So um, the, red, the red lines are for ships which uh, have more capacity to go through um, thicker ice, and the blue ones are more commercial ones which don't really need that many... Um, they, they wouldn't really resort to an icebreaker uh, accompanying them. So um, um, the red ones is the ones that can go through more tricky areas than the blue ones. Yes, I think it was uh, September or August, August and September, something like that. Does it make sense <laughs> as a geologist? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I think it's the same with, uh, these were taken only in September. So 1984 until 2016, everything is in September, all the data, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Oh, is it good? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Roxy from China. And uh, my background is in biology. So this is actually the first time I crossed my discipline to talk about tourism. So please be nice to me. <laughs> and, and before I approach my um, presentation, I would like to ask uh, any, uh, everyone, like, have you ever been to uh, Arctic as a tourist? I was in the Arctic Circle. Okay. Okay, good. So now let's start. So maybe um, anyone here has already so seen such news headline about the booming um, tourism in Arctic recently. People uh, often go to Arctic to see uh, polar bear and other Arctic animals, or even they, uh, they go for camping and explore the nature by uh, having a cruise ship. So probably anyone of you might ask, um, Arctic sounds something very far away from me. I'm not very familiar about this. A region, and how can we define Arctic? So for me, my understanding for Arctic is 
it's a continent that includes all of Alaska, Canada, uh, northern Canada, Quebec, and all of the Greenland, Iceland, and northernmost countries of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Uh, in the past, Arctic was just something you can only see in the picture or maybe from the news. But now, recently, due to the climate change, um, the, there is a decreasing on the sea ice, which makes more accessible to, for tourists. And since early um, 1800s, the Arctic has already started to attract more and more tourists. Um, so what tourists normally do in Arctic, they often maybe go for ski results. They visit, um, they, maybe they have like a cultural tour about the indig indigenous people to experience the culture and then the tradition. And they often go for uh, nature exploration to observe the icebergs and glaciers. Or people even go for adventure in Arctic. Um, so for me, my understanding about red flag is more about the challenge um, for the Arctic tourism. Uh, for example, the first thing I've, I can think of is about the accessibility. Maybe there's not enough international, um, uh, connect, uh, international direct flights to the Arctic region, and then maybe there's not enough road construction, so then we couldn't like freely drive a car to... Uh, enjoying the nature freely. And maybe there is a lack of national legislation and regulation. And um, for example, there will be extreme, uh, there will be restrictions about the, uh, about the access to the natural park. And because of the climate change, the sea ice decreased, so then we couldn't have, we could have less access to the ski result and other winter activities. And maybe because of more and more tourists, the, the environments can be damaged. There could be also some safety concerns, like if we go on a cruise ship, what if there is an accident? Mm, is there enough rescue ships provided? And most importantly, since Arctic is a continent that involves a lot of nations, so it is very difficult to apply just one single route to all the nations around. But on the other hand, of course, there are a lot of uh, bright futures about this Arctic tourism. For example, we can uh, generate more and more business and job opportunity to the local uh, indigenous people. Perhaps we can uh, have hotel and tour service and hire more um, local uh, people to do it. And we can also uh, boost their local economy, so then further we can support the community facility and service in the local area, which just further benefit the residents there. And people often uh, from all over the world. So then we have different culture to share with the local uh, people. And uh, for example, um, like in Alaska, there is an estimated 1.96 million visitors with 51% arriving on cruise ships and 45 traveling by air and another 4% by highways. And the visitors' spend, uh, spending was estimated about 1.82 billion US dollars. The total employment uh, indirectly or directly from this tourism industry was estimated about 39,000. So since there is a red challenge and then there's also blue future for us, that's why we have to have a kind of balance between the sustainability and then the economy. But how can we achieve this? First, we can educate and train the visitors and let them know about the climate change and the polar conditions. Then, then perhaps they can adapt their lifestyle and behavior to the local environment and the local culture. 
We can also conduct research and studies about the issues of climate change. Then we know like which way the polar tourism can sustainably function. Um, a good management practice can be selected for the purpose of concerning environmental and cultural integrity of polar region. If we can ac accurately determine the environmental costs and efforts, then we can measure the tour. Uh, we can uh, manage the tourism accordingly. Um, we can. Uh, um, furthermore, we can also uh, monitorizing and planning of the tourist flow. For example, we can do a research and know what is the carrying capacity of this tourism, uh, like the maximum tourist we can take each day. So then you want to like, exceed the limits. And we can also secure in the necessary investment in infrastructure improvement, like the toilet facility, the road uh, con uh, uh, construction, and then the entrance fee for natural attractions. Uh, if by tourism we can uh, impose some uh, hotel tax and then the airport tax for the tourists, so then the, the tax we, uh, the government then can use to further uh, create a better environment for the local population. And now I'm going to uh, have an example about Iceland. So, so probably um, a lot of people have already noticed there are two million tourists already poured into Iceland in 2018, which is more than four times of the entire, culture, uh, entire country's population. And tourism is, one, is actually one of Iceland's three economic pillars next to the fishing and mining. So by looking through this chart, you can know that the, uh, the tourism is actually like increasing every year. And then by 2018, you might uh, reach more than 30%. Um, of course, this... Um, Iceland's booming tourism can be envy of the other Arctic nations, but it also comes with some cost, maybe the rising cost of living in this country and then also lack of uh, government uh, service. So uh, therefore, we need a kind of um, revision on the tourism policy in Iceland with respect to both the tourism resource economy and then the, also the society grows. So now I'm going to reach my conclusion that there is a growth in terms of the numbers of tourists in the Arctic region. But on the other hand, we also receive a lot of challenges about maybe uh, less accessibility to the Arctic and also some uh, damage to the environment. But we can generate an equal tourism that we can uh, balance between the profit revenue and then the well-being of the local community in Arctic. So then everything is fairly shared. And I have a video um, about Arctic tourism. We're up in the Arctic and it's been amazing, you know, stepping onto shores where you see bare footprints and we're moving across the landscape. And I, I think amongst all of us, you had this feeling that you were eavesdropping in on one of these beautiful scenes of nature and how much we want it to always be here. That's a very special place. the land, the plants, the wildlife. We've run into the largest animal ever to live on the planet, a blue whale. And it, there he is. One of the vast expanses of untouched nature. It is one of the last spots on Earth where you actually can go to a place where very few people have been before you. What we're seeing here, it's the approach that we 
take when we come upon these extraordinary things that we've been witnessing. When we see life or icebergs or birds, walrus, whales there, something happens to us. We're inside this very special moment of intensified consciousness called exploration and discovery. So I guess I will stop here. So thanks for the listening and attention. And I hope you enjoy the rest of sweet day. Thanks. <laughs> and any question? Uh, well, I have a question. So as you are from China, and nowadays we see Chinese uh, tourists everywhere in the world. Uh, yes. So do you think that uh, Arctic can be also a important destination for Chinese tourists uh, in the future, or maybe it's already a famous destination for tourists from China? Yes, um, actually, um, nowadays, uh, Arctic tourism in China has gained more and more attention for us. Um, according to the data I have saw, it um, like the world visitors in Arctic region, uh, about 25 to 50 percent are mainly from China. So I guess, um, and normally um, Chinese tourists are willing to, exp uh, to spend a lot of money. So I guess it will be a huge input for the local economies. And then since China is a very big country that has um, 1.2 billion population, so even 1% of the population, let's say maybe 200 million, can occupy the entire Arctic. So, yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of economy, I think it's a positive thing. Yeah. Do you plan to, do you plan to visit Arctic as a tourist? Of course, yeah. <laughs> and I'm also willing to spend my money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And to point is like how just to like to the red color this one? Just okay. Thank you. So hello everybody. My name is Regina. I'm from Kazakhstan, and my presentation is about rights of indigenous people. In order to point your attention, I will use this uh, uh, blue, re uh, blue, red, and green uh, method approach. So and uh, I will use the uh, a uh, blue symbol in order to highlight the achievements in struggle for rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, the red one I will use for challenges, and the green one I will use for opportunities. So why indigenous people? Why we need to study their rights? As we all know from this course, Arctic has been changing, and more and more players and actors are involved into this region. But at the same time, these changes, they affect the inhabitants of this region, especially the indigenous people who lived here for more than 12,000 years. That's why, uh, therefore, it's impossible to understand changing in Arctic without studying the rise of indigenous people. So, and this uh, presentation addresses the question how and to which extent uh, uh, rights of indigenous people, they are respected in Arctic. I don't know how to use it. Uh, so, how many indigenous groups you know in the world? Any suggestions? <laughs> okay. Uh, like, I hope that from this course we know about Inuits, about Komi, about Evensk, about Chukchi. In total, only in Arctic, there are mo more than 40 different indigenous groups. And there are even more in the whole world. That's why we speak not about indigenous people, but indigenous peoples in plural, and in order to, to, to emphasize this uh, diversity among indigenous people. And the same was done by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights on Indigenous Peoples. Uh, so the next question is, what are the rights of indigenous peoples? Uh, 
In order to answer this question, I decided to consult the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted in 2007, and even this fact of adoption of the declaration is a great achievement for Indigenous Peoples. So uh, I analyzed this uh, declaration and I found like the most relevant rights for indigenous people in Arctic. So right number one, recognition. Right number two, maintenance of their own lifestyle. Right number three, self-determination. Right number four, participation in decision making. Right number five, protection of all languages. And right number six is the uh, right to land and resources. And uh, also, I use this uh, rights, this summary, as a methodological approach of my presentation. So my idea is to check how these rights are respected or no in Arctic. And also, what I also want to, put, to point you, to call your attention in this case, that um, it is a declaration. That's why it doesn't have any uh, binding international law. So, and there is no any supranational body who can say if the countries they respect the rights of indigenous people or not. So, right number one, recognition. Actually, the question if you are indigenous or not, it is not a simple question. Because all countries, they have some special way of understanding what is the indigenousness. So, uh, as you can see here, all these indigenous people, they are minorities, not only in their countries, but they are also minorities in the Arctic region. So it's, it is quite hard for them to communicate with each other because they are minorities and because they are uh, very far from each other. Like geograph geographical distance between there is huge. And also I said that it is a very hard question if you're indigenous or not, because all countries, they have some special way of understanding these indigenous. Uh, for example, in Alaska, uh, they use this blood, blood quantum, uh, quantum. And for Scandinavian countries, there is uh, the main criteria is if you speak in Sami language, uh, one of the language of indigenous people, or not. For example, in Russia, the criteria is that you, in order to be indigenous, you need to be belong to the uh, indigenous small numerical group, and you need to live somewhere in uh, Far East, Siberia, or North. So that's why, like, not all indigenous people in Russia, they really are counted as indigenous because of it is like very strict criteria. And nowadays, for example, we can say that in Russia there live about 250 indigenous peoples, but only 50,000 are counted as indigenous peoples. And saying in general, I can say that in total the population of Arctic is about 4 million people and only 10% of this population are indigenous peoples. So it is around uh, 400,000 people. And of course it's like a great challenge for recognition of your indigenous. About uh, the right number two, situation is better. So we can say, see here that in all these Arctic countries there are special programs uh, for maintaining the lifestyle and cultural heritage of indigenous peoples. So this, this actually, and this, all this um, legal framework, it was developed since 1970s. So I consider this like a great achievement and great opportunities for indigenous peoples to protect their lifestyle. Self-determination. Actually here I also can say that like situation is uh, more or less good. Uh, because depending on the uh, state organization of all these Arctic countries, for example, Russia is a federation, like, uh, or, like uh, Norway is a unitary country. So depending on the uh, state organization, uh, these indigenous people, they have autonomy, or in case it is not a federation, uh, at least they have like, uh, recognition of their voting rights and they have representation. For example, like in Scandinavian countries, in all the Scandinavian countries, they have Sami parliaments. Or, for example, in Russia, there are uh, eight uh, constituent entities, uh, which is also can be considered as autonomous of uh, indigenous people. And about Iceland, just you can see here, there is no indigenous people <laughs> that you can take a note of this. Uh, well, right number four, participation in decision making. So in this case, we need to say that indigenous peoples, they have their own organizations, which is, I consider, a great achievement of them, a great achievement. And these uh, organizations, they are represented in the Arctic Council. 
Uh, and uh, actually, it also gives great opportunities for indigenous people at least to know what happens in the, in the Arctic world. But at the same time, it's a great challenge also for indigenous people because they don't have veto rights in this organization. They uh, don't have uh, like right to vote. They just have these consultation rights. So right number five, protection of own languages. So you can see here the map of the languages in uh, Arctic region. And there are uh, five different language families of uh, these indigenous people in the region. And even there was a, if there is some legal framework in order to protect their languages, actually the situation here is not so good uh, because all these languages are considered as endangered languages by UNESCO. It means there is some, uh, some uh, they can disappear in the future, more or less. So it is a big challenge for indigenous peoples. And the most maybe important thing is the right to land and resources. Uh, we can say that on the national and international level, yes, of course, states they recognize um, rights of indigenous peoples. But when the question is about money, everybody forgets about it. And of course, uh, national governments, they don't really interested in recognition of this right of indigenous people uh, for their lands and resources. For example, uh, there is a convention of International Labour Organization on uh, tribes and indigenous peoples, which recognize the rights of indigenous people on rare land and resources. And only two countries in, in Arctic, in Arctic uh, recognize, uh, ratify this convention. It is Denmark and Norway. Indigenous people don't have sovereign rights on natural resources. And also, actually, in this case, we can say that uh, their, their rights on self-determination and for use of lands can be uh, like a double used in order to take out the national government uh, from this region and to share this, uh, uh, this uh, rich region in, like, in living and non-living resources. But also I can say that there are some opportunities for cooperation. For example, there are some initiatives of sharing revenues with indigenous people, which happens in Russia, for example. Uh, there are such big companies like Gazprom and Lukoil, and they share revenues with uh, indigenous peoples. And as a summary, uh, you, here you can see like, uh, my approach of these uh, blue, red, and uh, yellow colors. And here you can see that unfortunately, there are more challenges for indigenous peoples than opportunities or achievements. So such challenges like no supranational body to protect their rights, very difficult to understand the indigenousness, no better powers in Arctic Council, double use of self-determination, etc. Uh, about achievements, it's a great achievement, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples, uh, autonomy or voting rights on the national level, also consultation rights in Arctic Council. And uh, for opportunities, we have this sharing revenues initiatives and also um, I, I didn't say about it, but uh, when we speak about indigenous people, we need to understand that they don't really fight for sovereignty. They write for their sovereign rights. Uh, so it is very important when you speak about indigenous peoples. And as a conclusion, like in accordance to the summary, uh, we have the, I have this long conclusion. <laughs> With your permission, I will read it because like, it's the most important part of the, of the presentation. So, in spite of the significant achievements in protecting rights of indigenous peoples, this issue remains being a challenging one for international agenda. On the, inter on the national level, states uh, recognize the uniqueness of indigenous peoples, but their rights and on lands and natural resources, they are challenged by private, private and public companies and national authorities. Uh, there is some legal framework for protection uh, languages and unique style of indigenous peoples, but it, is, it doesn't really protect the languages of indigenous people in a due order. And uh, indigenous people groups, they are more or less autonomous, but at the same time, they do not hold a sovereignty. But like, to conclude, I want to say that um, there are some opportunities uh, for making this process even better. Uh, and I think that this can be achieved only in cooperation, not in, in dispute between national governments and indigenous people, but in cooperation between national governments and indigenous peoples. So let's cooperate for rights of indigenous peoples.
Thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, I think like most of all, most of us, we have like our background in political science and international relations, and we need to we know about this um, like this dispute between in international law about the right of self determination of nations and the right of protection of territorial integrity of states. So in this case, uh, like this region is quite rich in natural resources, uh, we can say that some external uh, powers they can really use this right of indigenous indigenous people for self-determination uh, as a way to take out this uh, lens from the legislation of national governments. So that's why I say about the due, uh, like double use of this right of self-determination of indigenous peoples. Uh, actually, you know, it's a little bit ironic, uh, but um, indigenous people are the people who most of all suffer from pollution in Arctic, but they are the people who less pollute. Uh, so I think maybe, bec uh, maybe to uh, yes, in case uh, if tourism will be very like uh, developed in Arctic, maybe it will pollute Arctic and it will um, influence the lifestyle of these indigenous peoples. But at the same time, it's also an opportunity because they will have more work, uh, like and they actually maybe they will give some take some money and funds to protect their uniqueness because it can be interesting in uh, in like in financial terms so we know when there are some money all the time process is working better so i see that like yes it can be danger for environment but at the same time it's opportunity if tourism will be uh, developed in arctic Ah, yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, this symbol, I'm not really good in drawings <laughs> of uh, symbols of indigenous peoples, but this symbol means house. And this mi mi uh, means uh, like fox, but I just really like it. I don't know. <laughs> so this one is more or less understandable. Not working? Yeah. Hello, everybody, once again. The last but not the least, Russia. Russia and Arctic. I'm going to use the Russian prism of colors in the Arctic and tell you a bit more about Russian uh, position in the Arctic region, who we are, what we do, and what our real goal is in the Arctic. So here we can see the North Pole. We can see the Russia, I think. How to press this thing like that? Like, we are taking the biggest part of uh, Arctic. It's about over uh, six million square kilometers. This is the total area of the Russian Arctic. And uh, we have the main reserves of the hydrocarbon and um, another raw materials and the minerals. The resources provide about 20% of the uh, GDP and 22% of the whole Russian export. And over 1 million people are living there, including 136,000 representatives of the indigenous people. I think it's a bit miscalculation that you had saying that Russia represents only like 50,000 people of the indigenous people. Yeah, we will talk about that uh, a bit later because it's much more of uh, indigenous people living in the Russian Arctic. Russian green light. For me, green light is saying like, like in the traffic, that we are given the green light for Russia to expand into the Arctic and uh, position ourselves better. Why? 
I will read, yes, the most important person in Russia, the President of Russian Federation. I'm going to read the quote. It's unlikely that anything can change our priorities in this region. Russia, which accounts for almost a third of the Arctic zone, realizes a special responsibility for this territory. Our goal is to ensure sustainable development of the Arctic, and this is the creation of modern infrastructure, development of the resources, development of industrial base, improving the quality of life of the indigenous people of the North. And I absolutely agree that it's going on right now. Because we have our own priorities. Oh, sorry, just covered the priorities. So according to our president and according to the government of Russian Federation, that our priorities are the sustainable development of the Arctic, and 17% of the Russian oil is produced in the Arctic, and I truly believe that this number and this figure will only increase in the future. We are interested in development of the resources, such as like oil and gas processing, electricity, development of the coal projects, and creating a new job placements. Uh, then soft industrialization. Why soft? Because we don't want to push the industrial zones into the Arctic. We do it softly and according to the environmental protection. And we need to improve the quality of life of the indigenous people. And, of course, the development of the Arctic Northern Route. It's one of the, our priorities in Russia. The Russian Arctic view future, we see it in the blue color as the whole of the world, because uh, the sea is created, the ice is melting, and we see it in uh, different perspectives. Because we have a really high possibility of a significant increase of the Arctic territory for Russia. But what is required for that? Uh, only just to prove that 1,200,000 square kilometers of the ocean flow between the Novosibirsk Island and the North Pole and Mendeleev Submarine uh, Plateau and the Lomonosov Ridge. It's the extension of the Russian continental shelf. And uh, then Russia will be able to add to its uh, exclusive economic zone a section of the sea button with the new oil and gas fields, with up to 5 billion tons of hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. But uh, how to do that? Of course, we need to do it according to the legal base, according to the legal frame, without any questions. So, the next steps forwards to our blue future, we need to develop uh, the oil and gas fields in the Arctic shelves, requires the reconstruction and construction of the new deep water port. For example, possibly it's going to be done in the uh, Muduga area in the Arhangelsk region. And uh, the highest importance is to stimulate the attraction of the investments into the Arctic, like creation of the new um, economic zones and the industrial parks. But uh, the long-term development for this infrastructure fully de depends on the climate change, on the ice melting. So we hope hope that the further warming of, uh, of the global climate will open the northern sea route for Russia. The most important red flag, I see it like this, uh, because uh, this was really important uh, action that was made by Russia. It was fully in the legal frame, no questions, but uh, from the geopolitical point of view, it's a real red flag. I will read you one quote of the Chilean Garov. He is an explorer, scientist, politician, and uh, he um, said that the flag will be a permanent mark of the Russia's presence on the North Pole. I will read. If a hundred or a thousand years from now someone goes down to where we were, they will see the Russian flag. Yes, they will see the Russian flag. I like this thing. So, a little bit uh, from the um, historical part, so why, why that happened. So, in 2001, Russia sent an application to the UN Committee um, um, that they were claiming that Lamanosa Fridge is the extension of our continental shelf. But it was rejected because they said it was not enough of proof that it's uh, our territory. Then Russian scientists decided to go and check, you know, to uh, do some more research on the ocean floor. So, that's why in 2007, uh, the record eye of the two Mir Batiscuffs to a depth of about like 4,000 um, kilometers, 4 kilometers were performed. And uh, then that Russian flag was put on the bottom of the North Pole. It was the uh, two deputies of the um, State Duma from the party United Russia, it was that Chilingarov guy, and the Gruzdev. 
Uh, and uh, they took the water samples and some soil, and uh, it's uh, going to uh, help us into the near future to prove that it's really our extension of the continental shelf. But oh, this is actually yeah, uh, the not a good quality of map. I'm really sorry about that. So this is about the Russia that they made claim for the territory that actually it's ours. But who is Chilingarov? Like, we, we heard a lot of about him, but exactly who, who, who is he? That's the big list, but not the biggest one, because he is really famous in Russia, like a scientist, like an um, oceanographist. He has a lot of medals, a lot of uh, diplomas. He was named the heroes of the Soviet of Union. He was named hero as the Russian Prefederation. He headed a bunch of the expeditions. One of them actually was in the 70s, and he proved that the northern uh, Arctic route is going to melt, and it's going to be like a whole year. It's allowed for you know shipping in the future. It was done in the 70s. So, and he was heading, uh, he was the head of this expedition, and he's really famous in Russia as the scientist, not like uh, in po politician. But now he is a member of the Bureau of the Supreme Council of the Party United of Russia, and uh, he's representative of the Russian uh, President for International Cooperation in the Arctic. And uh, he has uh, two, tasks, two tasks as a politician um, in this field. Uh, in Russia, we have a big problem with the law of the Arctic and the North, because it's about like 500 uh, different laws uh, that sometimes contradict each other. So he uh, pointed that we need to pass a framework law in the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, and we need to codif codify the existing Arctic legislation and bring it into the line with the requirements of the time. Uh, I see... Uh, even like regarding uh, the position of Russia, that the platform that we are creating is fully for the dialogue, it's fully in the legal framework, because we're interested and we are cooperating in the protection of the polar nature, and the scientific cooperation is one of the key priorities for Russia. We operate from the fact that there is no potential for any form of conflict in Russia, but still we have the military, uh, zones over there, and a lot of military is presented there. International norms clearly define the right of both coastal and other states and serve as a solid basis for joint work in solving, uh, in solving the problems of Arctic. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, but um, I want to tell you one thing. I don't see that any race uh, should be presented in the Arctic. We should cooperate. We should not find any kind of conflicts, e even when we try to get more territory for ourselves. It should be only done in the cooperation, only in the dialogue, only in the name of law and peace. So, thank you. That's the sources, and that's me. I'm a PhD student in political science um, in Kaliningrad, Manilkan, Baltic Federal University. So, yeah, that's me <laughs> from Russia with pride. Yay. I better come back over here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Questions? Yeah? Um, do you personally believe in this um, Oh, and even the picture. Yes, I truly believe in that. I truly believe that uh, as long as we are acting in the legal frame, as long as we are not doing any activity uh, illegally, uh, we're going to reach our blue future, and Russia is going to protect the Arctic as well. So yes, I sincerely believe in that. Oh, oh well. Uh, let's say now I presented the position of Russian government, the official one. Yes, uh, how our president view that, and how we are acting on the on the global 
uh, level. But there are a lot of different concepts from the academics, from the researchers, uh, from the scientists, er, or just from the students, from the, from the people. For example, I know that the really, really crazy project, uh, it named Sevir, like North. Uh, it was conducted by Russians and uh, one Italian architect. They're saying that the uh, like melting of ice and climate change is irreversible and it's going to be a, a lot of fights between states and they really want to stop that. They're suggesting uh, like new view of the like globalization, let's say like that. They want to stop any states uh, to get into the resources. They want to create the platform, even including that cryptocurrency, like that everybody around the world, you know, can put the money over there and uh, do the crowdfunding for the projects to preserve the nature, to create the real infrastructure, yes, for the shipping, but still in a really nice manner that the whole community, the global community, is taking care about the Arctic. So, and it's really nice point because uh, they're from Russia and it's, uh, and it's supported by the Institute Strelka. I, I worked with them personally as well because my company is working in like innovation and uh, high technology projects. And uh, they fully support this kind of alternative uh, way of thinking, an alternative way of view on the Arctic, that we need to preserve the nature and they really need to, like as a global community, to take care about it. So yeah, there are, there are, there are different concepts. You're welcome. Oh, I explained, I, I told that uh, in the beginning, like uh, they're saying that, like on the traffic, right. yes, you, you, you see, it's, it's the traffic, it, they're just giving us the green light, you know, and we can go straight without breaking any laws uh, and, uh, you know, follow our policy, that's the green light for Russia. Thank you.